All right, so let's fact check the 13.7 billion years, the history of everything. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see what we find out here. Let me pull my keyboard over here and we'll do some typing here real quick. Um, let's pull it up. How old is the universe? This is interesting to me. Now, it's, uh, Google will tell us it's 13.77 billion years old. And where were we ever at 13.7? Um, let's do it a little bit differently here. May 21st, 2013, down here it says, it's a news article, it says, how old is the universe? How old is the universe 13.82-ish billion years old? According to the observations of the European Space Agency's Planck mission, not the 13.7-ish, it's been uh, claiming as on its J-date profile. So that's kind of a that's, that's a bit of a funny there, I believe. So what does this mean? This means that new information has come to light, according to, let's pull up the article here, the European Space Agency's Planck mission. I think this is an article on Slate. And it says what the, uh, the universe is 13.82 billion years old. On Thursday, March tw uh, 21st, 2013, this is what they said. The universe is a wee bit older than we thought. Not only that, but turns out the ingredients are a little bit different too. And not only that, but the way they're mixed isn't quite what we expected e either. Uh, not only that, but there were hints and whispers of something much grander going on as well. So, <clears throat> you know, you can read this uh, if you'd like and pull up the article if you'd like. It's very interesting stuff. It's science. Science and history overlap. Certainly, at times, overlap quite a lot. 13.7 billion years. We should put just a little bit of an asterisk in here because, and uh, guess what? New evidence has come to light. So I kind of like, I'll put two asterisks in there just to be sure, uh, asterisks, just so, so we see that. Let's pop back up here to full screen um, so you can see where we're at here. This is uh, another slide, and I like this one quite a lot. It's going to show you uh, where did we come from? How did humanity begin? Well, the scientific revolution pushed the answers to these questions into the realm of rationalism and realism. We will study that towards the end of the year. New question arose, how can we uh, prove when the universe uh, started? How old is it? Nicholas Copernicus was one of these founding fathers of the scientific movement that says, you know, I know what the church is telling me. I know what religious thought has been, but is that potentially wrong based upon the ideas uh, that I can see as I look into the skies of the heavens and that and based upon the mathematical principles he's been able to uncover. This is a pretty famous uh, painting of Copernicus and it captures his conversations with God is what it's called and the emotion he must have felt in realizing that 1400 years of science so far had been wrong and the earth was not the center of the universe as originally thought. I'm going to play a quick video clip here for you. You can play this also as you see the notes will be in the, um, the description below this. But there's a, a man, Carl Sagan, who's pretty famous for his observations on science and history. When our prehistoric ancestors studied the sky after sunset, they observed that some of the stars were not fixed with respect to the constant pattern of the constellations. Instead, five of them moved slowly forward across the sky, then backward for a few months, then forward again, as if they couldn't quite make up their minds. We call them planets, the Greek word for wanderers. These planets presented a profound mystery. The earliest explanation was that they were living beings. How else explain their strange, looping behavior? Later, they were thought to be gods, and then disembodied astrological influences. But the real solution to this particular mystery is that the planets are worlds, that the Earth is one of them, and that they all go around the Sun according to precise mathematical laws. This discovery has led directly to our modern global civilization. 
the merging of imagination with observation produced an exact description of the solar system. Only then could you answer the fundamental question, the one at the root of modern science, what makes it all go? 2,000 years ago, no such question would even have been asked. The prevailing view had then been formulated by Claudius Ptolemy, an Alexandrian astronomer and also the preeminent astrologer of his time. Ptolemy believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, that the sun and the moon and the planets like Mars went around the Earth. It's the most natural idea in the world. The Earth seems steady, solid, immobile, while we can see the heavenly bodies rising and setting every day. But then how explain the loop-the-loop -loop motion of the planets in the sky, Mars, for example? This little machine shows Ptolemy's model. The planets were imagined to go around the Earth, attached to perfect crystal spheres, but not attached directly to the spheres, but indirectly through a kind of off-center wheel. The sphere turns, the little wheel rotates, and as seen from the Earth, Mars does its loop-the-loop. -loop. This model permitted reasonably accurate predictions of planetary motion, where a planet would be on a given day. Certainly good enough predictions for the precision of measurement in Ptolemy's time and much later. Supported by the church through the Dark Ages, Ptolemy's model effectively prevented the advance of astronomy for 1,500 years. Finally, in 1543, a quite different explanation of the apparent motion of the planets was published by a Polish cleric named Nicholas Copernicus. And so, you have a chance to see, uh, or hear, and see in here, Carl Sagan's version of events. Uh, he was an early astronomer. did did much to help understand help the understanding of the world as it is um, for people. Created some great video content as well. So <clears throat> the Enlightenment is this time period that um, followed in the 18th century, and we'll see this as we study world history this year. You also see it in six classes. Coffee was a big part of. The coffee house was a big part of the um, this process, and so when you study six glasses and you see that beer, wine, and spirits, alcoholic beverages, had been advancing through history as the drinks of choice for people, when you get into this more modern world in the 18th century, people start to drink a caffeinated beverage, tea and coffee, and when they do that. Boy, you see a big difference in the way people are thinking. There may be some more motivation uh, to keep studying and to discuss and to press because they're caffeinated instead of being um, under the influence of alcohol, or they'd be more uh, in a more depressed state. Um, the link in the video below uh, discusses did coffee fuel the age of enlightenment, and um, that's embedded in the, the presentation. You can certainly open that up and, and, sh and see that if you'd like. It'll definitely be in my discussion about coffee when we cover that uh, part of the book for uh, six glasses um, later on. With the scientific revolution and the enlightenment were spurred by two things, collaboration and caffeine. And uh, you see Captain America there, um, Benjamin Franklin. But to learn who rules over you, simply find out who you are not allowed to criticize. And that's a Voltaire, um, one of the great, probably the greatest mind of the Enlightenment. Montesquieu wrote, There is no greater tyranny than that which is perpetuated under the shield of law and in the name of justice. And basically what these thinkers did at that time was look at the world and how it was, and imagine a newer and better version of that world. One without a king who is presiding over the people with sort of an iron hand, and instead where the people have a voice. This is the Enlightenment. America was born out of Enlightenment principles. Here's another really great video clip. This one is from the same author on the last slide, Stephen Johnson. 
about collaboration and how that helps um, people to formulate new ideas. And I'll just leave this here for you. If you want to check it out yourself, you can. Um, the last part here, religious interpretations of the Big Bang Theory. It's kind of interesting stuff. The Roman Catholic Pope, Pius VII, declared that the Big Bang Theory does not conflict with the Catholic conception of creation. It's kind of interesting. In 1951, he made that observation. Some conservative Protestant Christian denominations have also welcomed the Big Bang Theory as supporting a historical interpretation of the doctrine of creation. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that there are places where science and religion can coexist. Um, as you see there, this is going to be big. Maybe a God himself or herself created the Big Bang in whatever way, and that is God's creation um, we have been able to witness to. We can't see beyond that, so we don't know what happened before that. So interesting stuff. Of course, a lot of students might just think I'm talking about the 2007 version of the Big Bang Theory. Um, that's a, a whole different thing, I, I believe. It's not that Big Bang Theory. So, uh, the cosmic calendar, if you were looking at it, this is what big history really is. If you were looking at it from a full year's perspective, today's date is July the 2nd. And so if you looked at July, well, the sun and the planets hadn't even formed yet, according to the cosmic calendar, if you condensed it into a single year. In August, when we come back to school, the sun and the planets would form, and it sure will seem like the sun is warm because it will be pretty darn hot. But you look at um, the one second before midnight at the end of this year is the voyage of Christopher Columbus. That is pretty intense. That means that human interaction on the planet is a mere speck compared to the length of time that the planet has existed according to science. Um, the bottom there is the WM map, or W map, which is the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy so, uh, probe that went out there and, and was able to gather the information of the beginning of the Big Bang. So why do we even discuss this at this point? The biggest reason is just to show you that evidence is what um, we're discussing here and talking about, and history is about evidence. Um, the study of big history of everything about the world is really kind of a fascinating thing, and, and it can change. As we showed you earlier, 3.7 billion, really? Maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit older than that. Um, and so it's hard to sometimes comprehend that things can definitely change depending upon um, the new evidence that comes to light. This is another video clip. It's called The History of Our World in 18 Minutes. David Christian is the person who discusses this big history component of world history and how it really should be uh, focused on a little bit more. Um, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an American um, astrophysicist and science communicator. There are people like uh, uh, who are following in the footsteps of Carl Sagan, who you heard earlier, who really do want to share the great and grandeur and incredible nature of science and share that with people. And he has a really cool video called What's the Most Astounding Fact That You Can Share With Us About the Universe? It was the answer to this question. And he said, basically, in a nutshell here, the knowledge that the atoms comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up our human body, that's the most amazing thing to him. And you can check out a couple different versions of him discussing it. This is one of those. It's just a few minutes long, but if you're interested, you can check it out on the website through there. It's also a really interesting video. I skipped over it here. It's called The History of the World in Two Hours. Um, it also looks at you know this this big history model because the very beginning of it is almost focused completely on like how the planet formed um, but the history of life on the planet dates back three billion years ago and the prolifer proliferation of life forms dates back only 600 million years ago you're looking at 13.8 or 13.7 years million years ago um, or billion years ago this is not that long in 600 million years but dinosaurs, who my students sometimes get confused and think, well, they must have walked to Earth with humans. It doesn't, in fact, look like it maybe did that. They occupied about 1.65 million years of the Earth's history, dinosaurs did. Yet most history books 
egotistically focused solely on humankind, and maybe uh, they shouldn't. If we're talking world history, truly world history, I guess that wouldn't. I also want to focus here on what the Advanced Placement course is about, and it's mostly about human history, so don't get to thinking that, boy, I'm going to have to learn about dinosaurs for the AP test. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. It's the dinosaurs and millions of other life forms that came and went that gave us so much of our energy today. Not just dinosaurs, of course, but the way the world was formed and uh, the life forms that died and decayed made up the life, the, the carbon that was compressed into the, the planet. And you can see Pangea there, the one, two, and three at the bottom uh, that goes back um, 200 million years ago. People evolving on the planet in the Cenozoic era is much, much different than when dinosaurs, mammals evolved, or dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. Obviously, humans, dinosaurs not interacting so much, according to science. Um, this is a video we'll see probably at the very beginning of school. It's called, um, it's from History for All of Us, The History of the World in Seven Minutes. It's pretty cool. If you want to check it out, that's, that's great. If not, you'll see it in class for sure. And I believe that's the last slide here. Let me check and find out. But uh, hopefully, oh, there it is. So what is world history? This is the last part here. It's a movement, largely an American endeavor. Not The rest of the world really isn't doing world history like we are. And Texas has been a big part of world history. Um, in Texas, world history has been taught at every school in Texas for the past, like, 8 to 10 years. Well, things have changed a little bit. It's now a choice. You can take either world geography or world history to graduate from high school. But uh, uh, honestly, if you're going to be an AP student, it's my belief you'll need both pre-AP world geography and AP world history. So what is world history? Strayer says it's an attempt to create a global understanding of the human past that highlights broad patterns cutting across particular civilizations and countries while focusing or acknowledging, sorry, an in inclusive fashion, the distinctive histories of its many people and its many peoples. It's not European history and the West. It's the it's also the rest. And what is world history? It is the rest, and then you compare it back to the West. And that's the emphasis on world history and not just Europe and the Western history. We look at big picture concepts, we do a lot of comparisons, a lot of connections, we look at change and the continuity over time periods and with certain empires and groups of people. Um, world history is a difficult course. Probably, I would think, the most difficult of the AP classes that you'll take in social studies. There are some exceptions depending on your ability levels, but it is a very difficult class. But I believe that what you'll learn will set you up for great success throughout the rest of your high school career and certainly in college. And believe me, I've been doing this 10 years now. When I hear back from students who have had success in college and they're so thankful that they learned the things that we didn't got a chance to talk about in my class, it has made an impact on me. It's certainly a reason that I've wanted to continue to teach it because I know it can really help students. An example of the kind of big picture comparison and change study of time is migration. We'll be looking at this uh, presentation towards the end of the year when we look at uh, reviewing for the AP test diaspora, the world that trade created, these migratory patterns of people, um, that's a big deal on the AP test. Those are the kind of questions that you're going to see, not like a singular question, a fact-based question about one particular group of people. It compares uh, people across time. It can also look and say, okay, how did this, this group of people impact this other group of people? Uh, the Anthropene Anthropocene, sorry, is a recent informational, informal geological uh, or chronological term that refers to human activities changing the significant, uh, significantly the nature of our planet. And you can see here, obviously, those are flights as they move around the globe. It's a really cool video, very interesting to make you think about how humans are impacting the globe that we live on. The next time I see you on a video here, it'll be chapter one. We'll be looking at the very beginning of a world history uh, in six classes. I would download the questions if I was you. I'd be reading through that first part of the book and have it maybe well understood before you have a chance to check out what I have to say. 
because that way um, you'll read the book, answer the questions, and also listen to the video clips. I think along those lines you'll be well prepared for the test when you come back to see me in, in August. So hopefully um, this has been helpful for you. I hope uh, possibly that what, you're, what you've been able to do here is um, helping you to get a better grasp on what it is we're studying or will study. And it's my great hope that you'll really enjoy world history and be impacted as much as my students were last year. And it was a great year, fantastic year. And it's going to be hard to top it this year. But I know somehow we can do it. Uh, it's always bigger and better. And so I uh, thank you for viewing. And we'll be back next time with a history of the world in six glasses, the first part, beer.